So good morning, everybody. It's terrific to see so many of you here um, for what's undoubtedly going to be a fascinating session today. Um, it's my pleasure to be chairing this, um, this morning's first session. We've got three presentations, which I'll run through very shortly, and we'll have a Q&A at the end of the session. Now turning to our speakers today on this um, first vulnerability session, Vulnerability and Refugee Status Determination. It's a pleasure to welcome um, Danny Kaunasala, Jennifer Blair, Cornelius Katona, and Yusuf Siftsi. We also have um, Desi Unitasari and Devi Yusifatasari um, with us um, remotely um, or virtually um, asynchronously in the form of a video presentation. You'll see on the programme, if you've got a, an older version of the programme, that it was listed that Annika Lindbergh would be presenting today, but unfortunately Annika is unable to present. So we'll have the three presentations, the first two of which will be delivered live, and then the third one is asynchronous and um, recorded. So turning to our second um, set of presenters um, today, it's a pleasure to welcome Jennifer Blair, Cornelius Katona and Yusuf Siftsi, who will be presenting on the topic of asylum seekers in disused military barracks, how the UK's first refugee camps harm residents' health. Jennifer Blair um, is a barrister and co-head of legal protection at the Helen Bamber Foundation. Jennifer has a master's in international human rights and is the modern slavery lead for the charity Migrants Organise. Professor Cornelius Katona is the medical director at the Helen Bamber Foundation, an emeritus professor of psychiatry at the University of Kent in the UK. He has prepared more than 2000 expert medical reports and has been widely published in relation to refugee mental health. And Dr. Yusuf Sifsi is the policy and advocacy officer at Doctors of the World. Yusuf holds a PhD in politics and international international relations and works on safe and inclusive healthcare. So Jennifer, Cornelius and Yusuf, you're all very welcome to turn on your cameras um, should you wish. You have up to 20 minutes, um, so please, whenever you're ready, um, do begin. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Cornelius Katona. I'm um, the medical director at the Helen Bamba Foundation. I should explain that we're an organization which um, provides integrated care for survivors of extreme human rights abuses such as torture and human trafficking. Um, I'm going to be talking about asylum seekers in disused military barracks, which are um, a sort of new experiment in the UK in which for the first time in a long period we have what is effectively uh, refugee camps in the UK and what my colleagues and I are going to be talking about is how we think that those camps may be harming residents mental and physical health. So two former military barracks opened in September 2020 one in Kent in the southeast of England and one in uh, Pembrokeshire in Wales. And this was at the height of the COVID pandemic. Um, in both the barrack sites, it was impossible to implement social distancing and recommended hygiene measures. Transfers to the barracks took place at very short notice, sometimes at night. Although there was an explicit commitment by uh, the UK Home Office not to place vulnerable people in the barracks, what we found quite quickly was that many vulnerable and physically and mentally unwell people were being placed there. Um, there was also a major outbreak of COVID-19 in the larger of the two barracks, in Napier Barracks in Folkestone. At the time, there were about 400 residents there, of whom about 200 contracted COVID and some became quite 
seriously ill. So that's the situation that we're going to talk briefly about. Um, I'm going to outline very briefly a literature review that my colleagues and I carried out of the effect of this sort of accommodation on both mental and physical health. And I'm also going to introduce some of our findings at the Helen Bamba Foundation on the independent medical assessments that we've carried out of Barrett's residents. So if we turn first to the literature review, this was an initial scoping review. We're hoping to um, carry out a, a proper systematic review in the coming months. Um, it was carried out primarily by two of my colleagues at the Helen Bamba Foundation, Drs. Jill O'Leary and Sean Edwards. Uh, we looked at both the peer-reviewed literature and the grey literature, and the main findings were that if one looks at refugees as a whole, and this is going to be very familiar to this audience, um, there are very high rates of mental health disorders, but a reduced likelihood of receiving treatment. And there were many post-migration factors, some of which we thought were particularly relevant to this sort of refugee camp environment, which contributed to poor mental health. Lack of welcome from the host community, a sense that people acquired of passivity, of meaningless, of powerlessness, of a slow immigration process, of being restricted in movement, of feeling that the staff supposedly looking after them were not helping very much, inappropriate or inadequate food, lack of privacy, religious needs not being met, a sense of being unsafe, not having proper access to healthcare, being separated, and I think this is a particularly important point, being separated from their wider society and being in institutional type accommodation. And if one thinks about the sort of accommodation these people were experiencing in the barracks, you can see that a lot of those rather bad boxes were being ticked. As far as physical health was concerned, the main emergent findings from the literature review were that there were high rates of respiratory tract infections, of gastrointestinal and skin infections, of communicable diseases, of preventable communicable diseases such as measles, varicella, and of course, COVID. There was also a problem around food insecurity, around overcrowding, dormitory accommodation, poor sanitation, and again, reduced access to healthcare as important contributors to poor physical health. So those are the main things we found from the literature review. In terms of the assessments that we carried out, um, one resident at the Penali camp in Wales told us, I feel broken psychologically, mentally and emotionally. And I think that sums up our findings quite nicely. We've carried out a total of eight assessments, six at the Penali camp in Wales, two at Napier camp. All the people that we assessed experienced worsening mental health. They all had significant depressive symptoms. And in addition, five out of the eight had significant symptoms suggestive of post-traumatic stress disorder. They also very frequently described difficulties in accessing healthcare. For example, they complained of pain, they were given paracetamol, but they were not referred for a medical or a nursing assessment. To go into a bit more detail, I thought it might be helpful to describe one particular case example. Um, this man, let us call him Irfan, it wasn't his real name, was tortured by a para paramilitary group in his home country before fleeing to the UK and being placed in barracks accommodation. He suffered ongoing pain from his torture injuries and that pain was untreated. He presented with symptoms of worsening depression and PTSD, and this was thought to be connected to his experience of lack of privacy and perhaps most importantly to the military, ex-military environment of the barracks, which reminded him of the situation in which he had previously been tortured. Now, I've just got one more um, virtual slide to talk about, and this is based on a meeting that I was involved in the day before yesterday, which was a meeting of a, a small consortium of 
um, workers from a range of charities working with barracks residents and barracks residents themselves. And what we found out at this meeting was, first of all, that at Napier Barracks, which was briefly shut and has now reopened, there may well be a new outbreak of COVID just starting. There have been efforts to vaccinate against COVID, but most of the residents have so far only had one dose of vaccine. The residents are receiving very mixed messages. They're being told on the one hand that the camp is being emptied as soon as possible, and also that it is going to be filled again um, to capacity as soon as possible. We have tried through both the um, on-site nurse and directly from the Home Office to get information on vulnerability screening, which goes back to the previous presentation, and we've been unable to get clear information either on screening or on safeguarding procedures at the barracks. What we do know is that tensions in the barracks are escalating. The residents are asking for on-site psychological support, which of course they are not receiving through official channels. Médecins Sans Frontières have started group psychoeducation sessions at um, the camp, initially only in Arabic, and another local charity is offering conversation classes. Um, we think that the camp is effectively being used as a reception centre within the specifications of the UK's new immigration plan. And one of the ideas is that interviews will take, asylum interviews will take place very quickly there. What we also know is that most interviews that have been attempted have been abandoned because of technical issues such as excessive noise, lack of privacy and lack of notice given to camp residents about their interviews. I'm going to hand over to Yusuf now. I hope I've not taken too much of your time. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Cornelius, uh, for providing this very essential background information about these new camps uh, uh, military, in the military works. So I will be speaking more about access to healthcare in this new camp, as we call it, uh, in this military barracks, and what are the situation about access in healthcare and how it actually exacerbates vulnerability that people already have um, in these barracks. Um, my organization, Dr. Software, has carried out 30 medical consultations with people in these barracks, and everything is based on what we see in these medical consultations. Uh, about you know access to healthcare, so we understand that health provision uh, is done through a private nurse on site, uh, and people seeking asylum in the camp are encouraged to see the nurse first to assess their medical problem, and then the nurse would triage the condition and then would uh, refer to a GP or specialist services. This is what we've been told. Um, from the authorities at the moment, but I think it's very important to note here that people seeking asylum are fully entitled to primary and secondary care services in the UK. Uh, like everyone else, they are entitled to reach out to their local GP practice and ask to be included as a patient in that GP practice and make appointment. They even have, obviously, the right to choose which doctors they want to see, depending on the availability. Um, we know that GP practice, GP access, is actually the main point of access to all NHS services. So most secondary care services and specialist services are done only via referral from a GP practice. So while these rights and entitlements are all in place, uh, when we look at the existing health provision for the barracks with this on-site nurse, we see that this healthcare provision is simply not adequate. So it's, uh, we, our doctors have seen unmet health needs um, among the populations, among the 30 people that we have uh, done consultations. And 74% 70, of the people we have seen said that they have bad or very bad health in general. And 70% had psychological conditions with very common reports of depression. Um, so it shows that this existing provision uh, of healthcare with the nurse uh, is not enough and it's, it, it just makes uh, it, it just cuts out uh, people's ability to access to mainstream healthcare services and people are asked to not uh, reach out to their GP, but 
to the nurse. In our experience, and we do outreach work in different hotels, uh, one nurse uh, cannot provide a meaningful health care up to 400 men um, at a time when we have a global pandemic. And in given the interpretation needs um, and also additional healthcare needs of people uh, seeking asylum. We then understood that the Home Office and the authorities uh, informed us that the, the all residents are actually registered with the GP automatically. Uh, but our evidence shows that people are not aware of this or they are told not to approach to their GP. And it's very unclear that if they ever received any notification of this GP registration or if they received their NHS numbers. So nine people in our consultations said that they do not have a GP registration. And four of them were actually in the last three months. So since April, um, uh, when the new cohort has, has been actually located in this um, accommodation. So this is very concerning because at the time of the pandemic, um, there has been huge efforts in the UK to vaccinate everyone. Uh, and the GP registration and having an NHS number is the main pathway to get the vaccination. So Cornelius has mentioned about the vaccination situation. We don't have a lot of evidence, but we know that first doses has been done. But it's still very concerning that people are not um, supported to register with a GP so that they can actually uh, follow the mainstream way to get vaccinated uh, in, the, in the barracks. We also understood that there is inadequate support for urgent medical and care needs in the in the barracks. Obviously, the nurse in the barracks is their daytimes. So in the evenings and in the weekend, people are asked to call 111, which is uh, an advice service with the NHS in urgent situations, or they are told to speak to a member of staff on the site so that they can help to get an urgent medical and care need. But there was one person we spoke to, um, and that person told us that he began to experience severe stomach pain, uh, but there was no action for 24 hours. After 24 hours, a member of staff then called an ambulance and the man would be had, had been taken to the hospital. And he was diagnosed with a medical condition, uh, which if untreated can really lead to life-threatening complications. Uh, he was actually offered a surgery, but he refused to get the surgery just because he thought he wouldn't take care of himself after the surgery in the recovery time in the barracks. So this actually shows that there is really not a meaningful support at the barracks in terms of care needs and medical needs and their urgent needs as well are not uh, paid attention uh, in this one. So. As a, as a summary, like we have seen that you know this existing situation is not enough for people's need, uh, and there has been significant healthcare needs, and the conditions, living conditions in the barracks, are not helping at all with these healthcare needs. Seven to four percent of the residents that we spoke to, which which is twenty people, they reported that they have little interest or pleasure in doing things. Uh, and 70%, 19 people reported they felt down, depressed or hopeless nearly all the time in the last two weeks at the time of uh, the consultation with us. Unfortunately, we heard 40%, which means 12 people, uh, they actually had suicidal ideation or suicidal attempt at some point while being accommodated at the barracks. So these figures have actually shown that uh, the living conditions and the access to healthcare is not enough and it's not helping people's uh, unmet uh, health needs. Uh, just to give an overview, in the UK, in initial accommodation centers, not just the camps, but in all initial accommodation centers, the healthcare provision is very similar. So there is a designated nurse um, and then people would be asked to go and see the nurse and not being uh, offered a GP registration. So this is a general problem, but when we consider the living conditions in barracks, it's really concerning that we have, uh, you know, we don't have uh, an enough support for people at a time where we have a global pandemic and we are putting people in dormitories, living very crowded conditions. So I hope this provided a glimpse of healthcare access and how it affects the vulnerability. But I'm going to hand over to Jennifer now to talk about vulnerability screening and, and externalization policies. Thank you. Thank you, Yusuf, and um, 
thank you, Ben, and everyone else for having us here at the conference today. I'm just going to apologise in advance for any woofing dogs you hear in the background during my talk. They are the plague of lockdown, um, or a good thing. So I'm just going to talk about the vulnerability screening process in the barracks, institutionalisation and discrimination in this form of accommodation, and then developments in policy and practice. And I'm a lawyer, not a medic, so I, that's why I'm focusing on some of the more legal and procedural aspects. So there, when the barracks was opened, the Home Office accepted that they were unsuitable in terms of the conditions, which are very bleak and harsh for vulnerable people. The definition they use for vulnerability has changed. So there have been six versions of the relevant policy over just a few months. Um, but basically, women and children are accepted as vulnerable for this criteria. They also accept disabled people are and victims of torture, rape and other serious forms of psychological, physical or sexual violence. Victims of trafficking are not necessarily considered vulnerable unless they've been referred into the UK identification mechanism, which is called the National Referral Mechanism here. Um, so there is a policy that vulnerable people won't be placed in these barracks camps, but it, in practice, the Home Office has no reliable means of screening for vulnerability. All they've really been doing is hoping they can identify who is vulnerable from what's already on the person's file, which might be the asylum screening, screening questionnaire where the person asks why they're claiming asylum and identity questions about their journey here. Um, but very briefly, it's a very short form or um, from the asylum support application form. But that's often filled out by telephone, particularly at the moment during um, COVID times with a support worker the person doesn't know and has never met so it's again it's often very very brief and um it's not the questions aren't framed to whether or not a person could cope with living in a barracks or refugee camp like environment so in reality there isn't a working vulnerability assessment tool the approach that has been taken around vulnerability assessment is in our view it's irrational refugee and asylum seeking populations are themselves vulnerable populations you can't carve out groups who are non-vulnerable there's also discriminatory so it's discriminatory to treat men seeking asylum as a non-vulnerable population so for example in the UK suicide rates are higher amongst men and there have now been at least seven documented suicide attempts in Napier barracks so it's not an evidence-based approach Clinicians from the Helen Bamber Foundation and Doctors of the World have found that, that men placed in the barracks are presenting with symptoms of mental illness and other illnesses that they didn't have before they were placed in, in that setting. This approach also discriminates on the basis of disability. So there's a need for a disability inclusive asylum system, not a high risk system, which will cause harm to vulnerable people who aren't identified, but an inclusive system which won't harm even vulnerable people so which would remove the disadvantage and allow all people in asylum support an equal chance to live safely and this kind of discrimination is prohibited in, under UK law by the Equality Act 2010. There's also an issue around the institutionalisation of people in asylum support accommodation so asylum accommodation in the UK is outsourced to private companies following procurement or tender exercises the last contracts were handed out in January 2019 and they were 10 year contracts, so very long contracts to just three companies. At the end of last year, so in December 2020, the UK High Court found that there was systemic unlawfulness and disability discrimination in the UK asylum accommodation system. So that's generally not just the barracks because there was a failure to monitor the contracts given to private companies. So they've got all these criteria that they must have to be minimum standards for accommodation, but they don't monitor them. So those standards are not there in practice. So the risk of outsourcing in this way is that you're commodifying people seeking asylum and the focus is then on keeping costs low and on the convenience of the contractor, not on what's fit for purpose as accommodation for a very vulnerable population. So institutional settings, these large scale holding facilities provide many potential benefits for a private company. So they've got greater control over those accommodated, there's efficiency savings when you have a mass of people together. So one receptionist can deal with housing issues for a large number of people, predictable repairs, easy evictions, and the control over movement can also have administrative benefits for the Home Office. So think of the detained fast track, which was found unlawful in the UK in 2015. 
but it's not a fit for purpose system for the people it's there to accommodate who need a home-like environment where they can recover from persecutory and traumatic past experiences. So finally, I'm just going to go over some updates in policy and practice around the barracks and camps. So since the establishment of the sites, there's been considerable media attention and campaigning from concerned communities. This has led to the closure of one of the two main camps. So Penali Camp in Wales was closed in March, partly negotiated by the Welsh government who were arguing that if they found alternate community accommodation for the men in the camp, would the camp be closed? And partly because they were going, the Home Office were going to have to apply for planning permission from the camp and that was going to be tricky for them to get, given the opposition from all statutory agencies in the local area. Um, medical organisations have called for the camps to be closed, written to the Secretary of State, the Chief, and Bo Chief Inspector of Borders and Immigration and Her Majesty's Inspector of Prisons did a combined assessment of the barracks and on an urgent basis published their preliminary findings which are online but found leadership failures from the Home Office found that the conditions there were filthy in points and um, the facilities for people at risk of self-harm were completely unacceptable. There's an inspection at the moment by the All Party Parliamentary Group on Immigration Detention where Yusuf, my co-presenter, is giving evidence in a few minutes. Um, there's been repeated questions raised by the Home Affairs Select Committee and the British Red Cross has recently launched a report um, called Far From A Home, which makes some useful recommendations about what a fit for purpose asylum system might look like. So I recommend having a look at it. In terms of what's going to happen next with the camps, it's very unclear. The first full legal challenge to the lawfulness of the camps was heard, but seems to have had very little impact on the Home Office, who treat it as only being retrospective, so only going up until March. And then they say, well, they've tweaked the conditions slightly, so now it's OK. So that legal challenge is a case called NB and others, where Liberty and JCWI intervened. And the judge found that the barracks conditions were unlawful. He said, I do not accept that accommodation there ensured a standard of living that was adequate for the health of the claimants. Insofar as the Home Office considered that accommodation was adequate for their needs, that view is irrational. In reality, it seems to me that the residents understood they were being held in the barracks and they were right. So he found that during a COVID outbreak that they were unlawfully detained because they weren't meant to be being detained, it was meant to be their home. He also found there was a failure to comply with the Equality Act, so the public sector equality duty, and the, this idea that they said they had a vulnerability screening exercise, but they didn't in fact have a workable one. So he said it was not sufficient simply to put suitability criteria in place. There were also had to be a reasonable system for gathering the information. Our charity, Helen Bamba Foundation, gave evidence on the vulnerability criteria, which was accepted by the judge. But the barracks remain open. And as um, Cornelia said, that the messaging is very mixed. But on the one hand, we're hearing they're, they're planning to refill the barracks to full capacity as soon as possible, including still using dormitories. Priti Patel, the Secretary of State, the Home Secretary, has um, closed a consultation on a new plan for immigration which included proposals to set up more reception centres in the UK, um, saying it's based on the reception centre model used in European countries like Denmark and Switzerland. It would provide basic accommodation, allowing for decisions and appeals to be processed quickly and fairly. So a kind of new fast track in a detained or pseudo detained setting. So I guess as a concluding note, there is an urgency in the UK for an evidence-based, fit-for-purpose, trauma-informed asylum system, but that's being pushed, that's being asked for in a political context, which is very harsh, and where detention-like reception centres are being promoted by the government. Thanks so much for that, um, Jennifer. Um, it's kind of difficult to know what to say after that. Um, not only your presentation, but also the insights um, provided by Yusuf and Cornelius. Thank you so much for, for being here to really give us those insights, which not many, not many of us hear. If we do hear about those insights, it's through, for instance, um, court cases. And as you say, they've not necessarily gained much traction um, with the government or even with the media. So thank you for sharing that. And I have no doubt that people are gonna have plenty of questions to ask. So the, the 
two presenters are Desi Unitasari and Devi Yusufatasari. Desi is a law student and human rights activist from Indonesia. She's currently pursuing a bachelor's degree in law at Ganesha University of Education in Bali. As she is passionate about the field of human rights, Desi has served as youth advisory for Amnesty International Indonesia in, and in the legal advocacy team of uh, Mata Hukum Indonesia Legal Aid Institute. Devi is also a law student and human rights activist from Indonesia. She is currently pursuing a bachelor's degree in law at Ganesha University um, of Education in Bali too. And similar to Desi, she has a real passion about human rights um, and has served on um, the same um, boards as uh, Desi. Their presentation is titled Examining Policies and Priorities of the Indonesian Government in Fulfilling the Rights of Refugees Amid the COVID-19 Pandemic. Good morning everyone, thank you for giving us this chance to be a part of this great conference. We are Desi Unitasari and Devi Svitasari from Ganesha University of Education in Bali, Indonesia. In this opportunity, we would like to present but our research paper of examining policies and priorities of the Indonesian government in fulfilling the rights of refugees amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Indonesia is a developing country that geographically connects the Asian region and Australia. Thus, the country has long been a major transit for asylum seekers and refugees, especially those who attempt to seek protection in Australia. Refugees in Indonesia need protection. Protection of refugees is not only about granting asylum but in other forms, namely legal protection of their rights and also protection against violence and threats to be returned to their country. The COVID-19 coronavirus has spread across the globe at an alarming pace with ominous consequences. The World Health Organization has declared the COVID-19 outbreak as a global pandemic, where approximately 210 countries have been affected. The COVID-19 virus has infected over 175 million people with more than 3.7 million deaths globally. In Indonesia, the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases have crossed the 1.9 million with 62,000 coronavirus-related deaths. In order to suppress the spread of the coronavirus, the government of Indonesia has implemented some policies which are in line with the World Health Organization recommendations and guidelines, commencing from the prevention stage, physical distancing, and work from home. While refugees are extremely vulnerable to the COVID-19 outbreak, and other than that, most of refugees in the world live in low to middle income countries, most of which have insufficient resources to deal with an outbreak of this magnitude. Also of Indonesia as a non-party to the 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugees and its 1967 protocol. However, it doesn't mean in the, in the government can walk away from its responsibilities. Indonesia still as a part of many international and regional human rights convention to ensure the rights of refugees such as the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Moreover, Indonesia's treatment of refugees is based on general obligation to protect and honor human rights. UNHCR is appealing to countries with way to do far more to find homes for millions of refugees and other displaced by conflict, persecution, or even seriously disturbing public order. This is as a report re release show that forced displacement is now affecting more than 1% of humanity one in every 97 people, and with fewer and fewer of those who flee being able to return home. Based on data from UNHCR and World Global Trends Report, until the end of 2019, the total number of refugees would quite reach 79.5 million people. This means that there is one refugee in every 97 population of the world. Of this, 13,747 of them take refuge in Indonesia. The report also not diminishing prospect for refugees when it comes to hopes of any quick to any quick end to their plight. In the 1990s, on average, 1.5 million refugees were able to return home each year. Over the past decade, the number has fallen to around 300 
thousand, meaning that growth in displacement is today for outstripping solution. And other than that, most of refugees and asylum seekers in Indonesia are staying in the epicenter of the COVID-19 outbreak and in other risk zones across the country. Moreover, refugees are often excluded from many countries' pandemic plans, including Indonesia. Since Indonesia hasn't ratified the 1951 Refugee Convention and the 1967 Protocol relating to the status of refugees, refugees don't have the rights to work, hence they have limited access to, the, to healthcare and sanitation facilities during the COVID-19 in the world. Moreover, the pandemic has unfortunately limited the opportunities for refugees to be engaged in self-reliance programs such as vocational training and livelihood activities. With educational and livelihood opportunities currently on hold due to COVID-19 restriction, many refugees see resettlement as their only option for a meaningful future. In the absence of prospect to use and develop their capacities, refugees live their lives in limbo, hoping to be resettled to a third country, but the reality is that resettlement places for refugees worldwide are extremely limited. While human rights is a basic right, everyday individuals covered by the right to life in politics, law, economic, social, and cultural. This right is a basic, basic right that must be acquired by every individual and community group without distinction, ethnicity, religion, and gender. This is as stated in Article 2 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948. The government seems still dependent on their cooperation with International Organization of Migration and the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees regarding the handling of refugees during the COVID-19 pandemic. The most vulnerable among the vulnerable are the refugees who have neither IAM support nor sufficient means to support themselves. While they are registered and monitored by the UNHCR, they rely really mostly on the constrained support of local Charities. Moreover, there are about 5,000 refugees are often unofficially referred to Indonesia as independent refugees as, as they live without formal support for, from any institution. They live precariously from their own savings, supported by a family member abroad or by engaging in informal labor Significant risks as refugees are legally prohibited from working in Indonesia. Most rented houses located in Jakarta and surrounding cities such as Depok and Bogor as refugees stay has become increasingly unpredictable. Many independent refugees have, have run out of money. This challenge was further exacerbated in March 2018 when IOM stopped listing more refugees under its existing case load. As a result, a third group emerged. Hundreds of refugees, if no more, have become homeless and increasingly reliant on unsustainable generosity of local non-profit organizations and philanthropic endeavors. While handling refugees in Indonesia is experiencing difficulties due to several factors, in general, there are international refugee problems in Indonesia. The problems are as follows. The first is inadequate regulation, the second is facilities in poor support areas, the third is social problems, the fourth lack of assistance service, and the fifth determining status of refugee in Indonesia. For the first is inadequate regulation, the inadequacy of Indonesia's legal framework in upholding refugees' basic rights during the COVID-19 pandemic also met refugees within Indonesia can only stay temporarily until they are settled to a third country or third country or voluntarily repatriated to their countries of origin. Initially, there were only three articles in the Law of the Republic of Indonesia number no. 37 of 1999 concerning international relations which regulates the handling of refugees in Indonesia. Nevertheless, eventually the government established the Presidential Regulation No. 125 of 2016 concerning the handling of foreign refugees as a guideline for dealing with refugees and asylum seekers in Indonesia. This regulation recognized the fundamental right to seek asylum and refugee, 
and provide some clarity regarding the status of refugees and asylum seekers in Indonesia. The degree is still largely limited in its scope and falls to provide sufficient guidance on refugee rights. Especially in pandemic era, refugees still didn't get their basic rights such as being able to work, gain access to formal education, and have freedom of mobility. Hence, this absence of specific legal regulation regarding refugees has resulted in a legal vacuum in dealing with refugees to uphold their basic rights. And for second, poor facilities and support areas. Indonesia has 13 immigration detention houses. The immigration detention house is not refugee shelter. It has been recognized by the immigration authorities that there is no provision for the immigration detention house to accommodate refugees. The implication is that the government has no place to accommodate refugees. In the event of an emergency, the government can accommodate them in local government-owned areas, but after that, the immigration must temporarily take charge. After being temporarily housed in the immigration detention house, there is actually a possibility of placing them outside the immigration detention center as long as there is a guarantee, but the government is not willing to provide the guarantee. Therefore, in practice, there are homestays home stays rented by the international organization working with the immigration authorities such as International Organization for Migration to provide shelter for refugees outside the immigration detention houses and for the third will be explained by my partner and the third is regarding social problems a number of social problems are caused by the prison of the refugees for the example in the term of national security it's important to be cautious because of the possibility of a foreign spy or member of an international terrorist network posing as a refugee in order to spread his ideology. There is also the possibility of refugees bringing in diseases that could cause an epidemic in Indonesia, since refugees also have the right to mobility and interact with local residents. Even though Indonesia has recognized refugee and asylum seeker as a vulnerable category for COVID-19 response, however, the government has not conducted any direct practical action towards refugee communities apart from the opening shelter and safe houses for the female refugees that were victims of violence. For the word is lack of the assistance services. Asylum seekers and re refugees can only receive services from the International Organization for Migration through a referral from immigration officials. As a result, many of them become displaced. Asylum seekers and refugees in Indonesia are also unable to obtain local identity documents such as official status permit known as identity card or national identity cards. Without the document, they cannot work illegally. The absence of an exact legal status also often limit their ability to obtain social services such as health and education facilities. The inability to send their children to school do the most of them live in overcrowded camps with poor hygiene and sanitary facilities and severely limited access especially to medical facilities. For the fifth is determining status of the refugee in Indonesia. By not being a party to the 1951 convention and 1967 protocol, the Indonesian government doesn't have the authority to provide refugee status determination, so that the regulation for handling refugees in Indonesia only rely on the status of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, following the mandatory save by Indonesia in 1951. Moreover, Indonesia, has, Indonesia only has the status of the uh, second country or what is also called a transit country, not a third country, or what is also called a destination country. By relying solely on the status from the UNHCR alone, the refugee handling process consists of the several stages, starting from the process of finding refugees in Indonesia territory, then being placed in Jerudeni, under the auspices of the local immigration office, to the process of determining status by UNHCR and finally, after determining the status of the refugee, they are transferred to a third country, still settled in their local country or returned to their country of origin. But in fact, the UNHCR is under staff and its budget is insufficient to adequately deal with refugee issues in Indonesia. As a consequence, people in need of protection may in fact be refused by the UNHCR do more inadequacies in system 
such as in a Spanish case officer, but also including a lack of legal assistance for asylum seekers. For the solution for international refugee problem in Indonesia, to solve the problem, we propose the solution such as first look at the experience of other countries. First, Indonesia policy makers can look the experience of other countries when handling the problem of refugees and asylum seekers in order to acquire knowledge and ideas about programs that have been implemented. Indonesia government can also learn from the practice in India and Malaysia as a progressive commitment from the state who are not signatory to the 1951 Refugee Convention and its 1967 protocol. For the example, in India, Tibetan refugees' right to residency is contingent upon a registration certificate, which is a legal document issued by Indian authorities equivalent to an identity card. For instance, Indonesia can create a card to izin tinggal sementara untuk pengungsi or temporary stay permit card or collaborate in partnership with local and international agencies to establish livelihood opportunities. This step will help Indonesian government create a policy that accommodates its need by transferring relevant effective approach that have been taken by another country. This will ensure that the rights of the international refugees are not ignored during the data collection process, the placement at the point refugee, and after the waiting period when being moved to the third country. And the second is increase the number of community housing and independent shelters. Currently, an estimate 14,000 foreign refugees and asylum seekers reside in Indonesia, a total of 19 a total of 1,019 people live in immigration detention houses separate across 13 regions. 2,000 people are handled by the community houses and the rest are allowed to independently take care of the, their need by staying under immigration supervision. The houses of Indonesian immigration detention are run by the Indonesian government. But the system doesn't have adequate facility, transparent or complaining mechanism. This has resulted in violation of human rights becoming commonplace. And the third is implementing productivity empowerment schemes. Indonesian government must implement productivity empowerment schemes as the one of the steps to enable refugees to live independently. In addition to economic benefits, opportunity to work will also incentivize them to affect to overcome language barriers and learn the national language, which will improve interaction with local people. Better interaction minimizes risks of misunderstanding and conflict. Or can be implemented temporary work permits. For the example, in 2000, Malaysia as the host of more than 150,000 Refugee and asylum seeker provided non-renewable segments were permits for Rohingya refugees from Myanmar. In 2015, Malaysia had considered in multiple cases the creation of temporary work permits. Strategies could be an option to provide employment access for refugees while expanding job opportunity for locals. So the conclusion is, the COVID-19 pandemic has been challenging on many fronts for the refugees and the local house community alike. Indonesia as a transit country has a number of refugees running away from the conflict areas. Indonesia desperately needs to resolve the inconsistency between refugee policy and practice if it's to respect and protect the rights of asylum seekers and refugees who may be in the country for years to come. Indonesia government needs to do more to improve refugee situation while they are in Indonesia. We appeal for refugees to be given opportunity for education, health, and empowerment. This will have a tremendous impact on well-being of refugees as well as allow them to contribute to their health community here in Indonesia. Even though Indonesia has not ratified the 1951 International Convention and the Additional Protocol in 1967, Indonesia declared its full support for basic principle of human rights. This was stay in UN Charter and recorded in the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a standard of shared achievement for all people and nation. That's all from us. Thank you. Thanks so much, Desi and Devi, um, and thank you to Nick as well for um, 
for hosting that for us and uh, it was quite nice for once to not be in charge of the tech which is my usual role so thank you for that nick um i think a really fascinating um, extremely detailed presentation there from desi and debbie um shining a spotlight on the indonesian context and also raising some really important points and um, for instance ensuring consistency of implementation um, when it comes to refugee policy and laws Okay, so that now brings us to the end of our um, presentations for this session. Well, thank you so much to all of our presenters and those who are still present and those who are absent. Um, it was a terrific panel and thank you to everyone who is here participating and for all of your inputs.